This episode is sponsored by Masterclass. Though it is really important to know stuff, Masterclass's world-famous instructors show you how to do what's important to you. When I set out to prepare for this podcast almost exactly one year ago, I knew in April 2020 that I needed to get better at writing. That's where one of my favorite authors, Malcolm Gladwell, came in. Masterclass makes it possible for me and others wanting to improve their writing to take a class from Malcolm Gladwell on writing at our own pace. You can watch and in many cases listen to awesome instructors like Malcolm Gladwell teach you how to do what's important to you. You want to be a better cook? Gordon Ramsay teaches you how on the Masterclass platform. You want to learn how to act? Natalie Portman teaches you on the Masterclass platform. Grow yourself and support Forgotten Wars by trying Masterclass for the year using the link in our show notes. Learn how to do what's important to you from the experts. Now to our episode. This is Forgotten Wars. It was March 1902. The Boers and the Brits would clash again at Twibosh. One side would carry away one of their enemy's leading generals. Would this put a nail in the coffin of the Boer War effort or bring British Parliament to call for peace as soon as possible? This Battle of Twibosh, or De Clip Drift, followed months of the British unsuccessfully chasing Devet all over southern Africa, or so it must have felt to a frustrated Kitchener. Devet and Stain managed to escape entrapment again, this time breaking through at least three blockhouse lines and out of the Orange Free State. They even met Delaray briefly in the western Transvaal. No blockhouse system could corral wars in this region, a region too devoid of water to plant blockhouses. So Kitchener left nine different column commanders with extra mobile forces at their disposal. Their job? Get Delaray, wherever he was lurking between Mafeking and Mahali's Berg. Under the British flag, you will have everything you desire. But that flag will continue to fly over the land. Over the land, maybe. Over the people, never. You will see me in the field, fighting for our independence, long after you and your party who make war with your mouths have fled the country. I don't think the Boers will have a chance. Disarm your blacks, act the part of a white man in a white man's war. Civilized war is awful. On February 24, 1902, Delaray struck a wagon convoy that was part of this effort to catch him. Delaray's men killed, wounded, or captured nearly 400 Brits, then vanished again. The Lord Methuen you heard about early on in the war, the general who first led the British war effort in the Cape Colony and Orange Free State, but then was disgraced and nearly stripped of his command at Mahersfontein. That Lord Methuen led one of those nine columns on March 7th when Delaray struck again. Methuen led about 1,300 inexperienced yeomanry and other irregulars from Twibosh at 3 a.m., with his main force of 900 leading the way and the rest trailing with his ox wagon convoy. I bet you know who gets attacked first. At 5 a.m., General Fonsale led part of Delaray's 750 men in an attack on the wagon convoy. Methuen tried to pull his two forces together, but couldn't in the chaos. His artillery guns focused on the war attack on the wagon convoy. Methuen tried to pull his two forces together, but couldn't in the chaos. His artillery guns focused on the war attack on the wagon convoy. So then the main Boer force attacked the right flank of Methuen's main force and the right rear guard. 
Three times, war horsemen galloped close to British forces and fired, not showing any fear of inaccurate artillery and rifle fire coming from the raw British recruits. Then Delaray rode along on the fourth charge. This time they rode through the terrified main British forces contingent and then attacked the British ox wagon convoy from a third side. At one point, Delaray rode into a pack of British combatants, thinking they were his own wars, and then had to beat a narrow escape. Remember, a lot of Delaray's men wore British khakis when their own clothes fell apart. Methuen fared much worse. First, he took a bullet to the leg while riding horseback. Then, Methuen's horse got shot out from under him and then rolled over Methuen's wounded leg and broke the leg. But that wasn't the worst of it for Methuen. Delaray, with General Yan Kemp and General Johann Selier, annihilated Methuen's force. Many of Methuen's men panicked and fled the battle. In the end, the wars suffered 34 casualties while killing and wounding nearly 200 Brits and capturing 500 horses and mules, 120 supply wagons with ammunition, and 859 prisoners, including Methuen. Delaray kept characteristically classy and released Methuen back to the British so that Methuen could get better medical attention, you know, for his bullet wound and broken leg. This kindness of Kuss actually forged a friendship that would last a lifetime between he and Lord Methuen. So did capturing Methuen ultimately matter? No. Kitchener reverted to sending tens of thousands of Brits to steamroll the area, but yielded little. Another force began rolling even more swiftly on January 25, 1902. Many listeners with a Reformed theology background will recognize the man who sped this force up. Dutch Prime Minister Dr. Abraham Kuyper contacted the British government on this day, offering his services as a peacemaker between his racial and theological cousins and the British. Lord Kitchener passed word on of this only to the Transvaal's acting president, Skulk Berger. Kitchener knew President Steyn and free state leaders still rejected peace that stripped away freedom of the Boer republics. By April, what was left of the Transvaal and free state leaders met at Klerksdorp in the Transvaal. Those men who met were not faint of heart. These bitter enders, a.k.a. bitter enders, kept fighting even after Pardeberg, even after being forced out of Natal, after Falkrans, even after the fall of Bloemfontein and Praetoria, even after thousands of war warriors surrendered over the months and years, these leaders fought on. They sometimes even fought against their former brothers in arms, Pete de Vette, Christian's brother, Andries Cronier, whose brother surrendered at Pardeberg. For example, lost all hope of war victory and instead took British money to fight against Republican forces. Joiners like Pete DeVette and Andries Cronier hoped they could end the horrors of the war, scorched earth, concentration camps and all, by helping the British end the war. Some joiners served honorably, depending who you ask. Others did their land great dishonor. For example, Captain Olaf Berg led surrendered wars and some black soldiers not only in attacking war commandos near Winberg, but also burning down homesteads and even molesting women and children there. Kitchener incorporated Transvaal joiners into national scout columns that fought under British supervision. Some national scouts fought on the British side at Twi Bosch, where Methuen got captured. National scout members' families lived in houses of bitter ender men, while those bitter ender families lived in concentration camps. In December 1901, families of national scout members moved to separate concentration camps that had similar food rations, but much better medical care than camps where bitter ender families suffered. Pete DeVette helped establish the Orange River Colony volunteers for former Free State joiners. These joiners served mainly as scouts and guides. 
By the time Republican bitter ender leaders met at Klerksdorp in April 1902, about 5,000 Boers actively served alongside British columns, compared to less than 20,000 Boers still fighting in the field for their freedom. Those leaders of the remaining Boers fighting for Republican freedom drew up a peace proposal that still maintained independent republics. President Stain maintained that if the British, quote, did not wish the republics to remain independent, the struggle must continue. Of course, the republics were willing to demilitarize, extend the vote to Oitlanders now, sign a binding treaty of friendship with Britain, and give the English language equal rights to the Dutch language. Even if Republican leaders had no chance of turning the tide of the war against an enemy that outnumbered them almost 15 to 1, men like Stain hoped that holding on would drain the British Treasury some more and make British Parliament and voters tired of carrying on the war. Kitchener sat in on negotiations when they moved to Pretoria on April 12th. Lord Alfred Milner joined the negotiators on April 14th. Eventually, London laughed at these Klerksdorp terms and replied with roughly the same points they proposed to Boota at Middleberg nearly a year before. The British eventually guaranteed safe travel for 60 Transvaal and Free State delegates, elected by commandos still in the field, to meet again for peace negotiations at, I'll butcher this, Farina Hung. While war leaders convened, General Jan Kemp and General Ferdinandes Poitheater led wars into the final formal battle of the Anglo Boer War, near a farm called Royval. The battle ended with Kemp and Poitheater charging ahead of their 1,700 horsemen with no cover into Keekwich's 3,000 entrenched men, six artillery pieces, and two pom poms. Pakenham compares this doomed attack to the charge of the Light Brigade back in the Crimean War, and then writes, quote, To continue the charge seemed folly, if not madness. Yet Kemp and Port Heater both accepted the challenge. In their attempt to outdo Delaray's achievements, they threw his tactics to the winds. They cantered on, forming a massed phalanx two, three, or four deep, the six British guns began to tear holes into the column. Still they came on, gambling everything on the chance that the British would turn and run. If fortune always favored the brave, Kemp and Port Heater would have won the most spectacular victory of the war. As it was, they were assisted by the shooting of Keekwich's mounted infantry, which was dismally wide of the mark. Some of the raw yeomen turned and fled, Lieutenant Carlos Hickey had just gone off to tell the commanding officer of the convoy to laher it up. Suddenly, he saw a mob of panic-stricken yeomen galloping back. I tried to get hold of these faint-hearted ones to line them up on the flank, but nothing would stop them. It takes a strong man to shoot one of his own men, but I thought I should be driven to do it that day. The galloping men stampeded the convoy. End quote. But no wars followed. Instead, Port Heater lay a mile away with three bullets to his head and body, along with 50 dead or seriously wounded wars. The charge was broken. But for various reasons, Ian Hamilton and company took hours to organize a mop up, a counterattack. The belated mop up only bagged 50 wars. Meanwhile, where Poit Heater lay dead, Brits foraged for food. Some took pictures of each other with a Kodak camera, and many collected war wounded on ambulance wagons. Now all that mattered was what was happening at Clerksdorp, and continued at Farenahung, then Praetoria. War delegates began meeting on May 15th at Farenahung. These warriors and leaders were all too aware how hopeless their efforts were to trigger an uprising in the Cape Colony, how much their women and children were suffering in concentration camps, how helpless they were to provide for women and children that the British simply left destitute on the felt beginning in December 1901, 
and how helpless they were to stop natives from committing, quote, murders and all sorts of cruelties, end quote, against war warriors and war women and children. Louis Bota really drove that violent native point home. Bota and Jan Smuts argued persuasively to the delegates that keeping the resistance on for another year would leave any survivors with even less leverage in treaty negotiations by 1903. Costello Ray, General Herzog, and President Stain's wing, with many free state delegates, scorned Smuts and Bota's arguments. But in the end, Smuts and Bota's arguments won the day. On the British side, Milner and Kitchener continued to disagree over what sort of peace to offer the Boers. Milner demanded far more, wanting the influence of Republican generals and leaders completely destroyed. In Lord Milner's mind, the peace he wanted would give a much freer hand to mold the future South Africa that would emerge from the ashes, a South Africa run by men like the Cape Loyalists and Oitlanders. Lord Kitchener wanted to be far more accommodating and allow the war leaders to make a more dignified peace so that, in his mind, the war would end sooner, so that the empire could stop broadcasting to the world that most of their troops still remained bogged down in southern Africa, and so the remaining war leaders would be more likely to reconcile with the British Empire after the war. Neither man got all he wanted. The 60 war delegates selected five men to form their negotiating team. General Bota, General Delaray, and Jan Smuts, now putting his attorney hat back on, to represent the Transvaal. And General Christian de Vett and General Herzog, also putting his attorney hat back on, to represent the Free State. This team wrangled for days with Kitchener and Milner and their legal team. Devet exploded when the British delegation insisted that the republics let go of their independence and call King Edward VII their king. Milner seemed all too pleased with this, all too pleased to end negotiations and ground the war rebels into dust on the field. But once the generals, especially Devet, left the room, Smuts and Herzog went to work at Kitchener's encouragement to draft something they could eventually run by Devet. The proposal aligned with the 10-point Middleberg terms proposed to Bota a year earlier, but with three major changes. First, Cape rebels, except for their leaders, would not be imprisoned, but would instead be banned from voting for five years. Second, the natives, the blacks, would not have any shot of getting the vote until after South Africa was self-governing not before. Was there any way in the real world that even a decade later, a self-governing South Africa led by leaders of Natal, the Transvaal, the Free State, and Cape Colony would willfully grant blacks the vote? Ha! Third, the British government would agree to pay pre-war debts of the ex-republics up to three million pounds instead of one million pounds. The Brits would also offer generous loans to both loyalists and former rebels. British cabinet, including Joseph Chamberlain, liked these terms well enough to let the natives be indefinitely disenfranchised, but not enough to go without saying that the three million pounds would cover war losses. The Salisbury cabinet returned the updated peace terms to the Boer delegates on May 27th. The Boers could only say yes or no. No more negotiating. Could these delegates bear to let their women and children drift about on the felt, vulnerable to violence, with not even a concentration camp willing to admit them? Would they reject this peace offer and fight until only Oitlanders and loyalists remained to lead whatever government rose out of the ashes? Devet argued as long as he could that the fight, despite all the evidence, could go on. But Herzog couldn't maintain this dream. On May 31st, 1902, at 2 p.m. in Farenahung, the 60 war delegates voted on the peace terms. Devet ultimately joined the 54 delegates who opted for peace and unity between the delegates. Then, the British rushed 
Skalk Berger, and Christian de Vett by train to Pretoria, where they signed away their respective republic's independence. Then, Kitchener and Milner signed. Then it was over. Days later, all but 20,000 of Kitchener's quarter million steamed toward Britain. 21,000 bitter enders threw their rifles into heaps and went to find their families in those wretched concentration camps. Historian Andre Vessels argues that some bitter enders believed that war peace negotiators had sold their countrymen out. Like many Germans after the Great War of 1914 to 1918, some Afrikaners believed that they were not actually defeated militarily in the war and could therefore have continued their struggle. Quote, Like the Germans who after 1918 believed that they had been stabbed in the back by the Weimar politicians who negotiated for peace and had surrendered, see the stabbed in the back myth that was propagated by Adolf Hitler and his Nazi followers, some Afrikaners believed erroneously on conclusion of the anglo War War, that they could have continued to pursue the guerrilla war against the British with success, but had been betrayed by people such as General Louis Boita and General Jan Smuts, both of them prominent Transvaal commanding officers. End quote. A few other Afrikaners would say after that that the British only won the war because of putting Boer's families into concentration camps. This assertion lacks logic, to say the least. Queen Victoria reigned over the British Empire from 1837 to 1901. That's over 60 years. During those years, the British Army engaged in 230 wars, campaigns, and punitive expeditions. The anglo Boer War was the 226th of those. So what did this war cost? The British government spent £217 million on this war, more than 20 times what they'd predicted before. About 350,000 of the half million horses, donkeys, and mules that the war office threw into this war died. Of 450,000 British men who served in this South African War of 1899 to 1902, 22,000 of those died in the field. Of those 22,000, only 9,000 died in combat, while over 13,000 died from facal oral illnesses like enteric fever, meaning more British men died because of ingesting human poop particles from water, dust, or flies than men who died from bullet wounds. Little wonder that they couldn't keep wars that they didn't care about from dying from preventable diseases in their concentration camps. Speaking of concentration camps, four times as many women and children, 28,000, died in those refugee camps as wars battling in the field. Of the 83,000 wars who took up arms for their republics, and around 2,000 foreign volunteers, 7,000 died in the field. The surviving veterans returned to homes, towns, countrysides, devastated beyond recognition. 63,000 made claims on some of the 3 million pounds that the British promised for rebuilding. But money flowed disproportionately to loyalists, hands-uppers, and oitlanders. We mentioned in a previous episode that the British burned over 30,000 war homesteads to the ground during the war. But tens of thousands of black laborers' homesteads lay in ashes after the war, too. Those Africans with property before the war filed 661,000 pounds in compensation claims, but successfully saw that money far less than even war bitter enders. Those Africans were treated with even more contempt by Boers of this new British domain. Blacks and coloreds looked with increasing distrust on all whites, with the British selling them out for greater white reconciliation in Southern Africa. Black groups like the ANC, the African National Congress, would fight against white domination and clash with Afrikaner nationalist groups 
who were also working to fight against British domination. Afrikaners and English never found sufficient reconciliation and healing from the trauma of the war, so future Afrikaner generations emerged as bitter as ever about the war and the concentration camps. Blacks and coloreds remained marginalized and left to harbor and breed more resentment of their own. And yet another instance of history rhyming. Many Afrikaners for decades after the war harbored hatred and fear against any foreign intervention, like the British intervention that came allegedly on behalf of the Oitlanders, foreign intervention that doomed them during the Anglo-Boer War. But this hatred and fear extended towards any that many Afrikaners saw as the other, whether that be English who remained in their midst or the colored, the Indian, the Chinese, and the black that still greatly outnumbered them. Afrikaners elected leaders intent on keeping these others from taking Afrikaner sovereignty away again, and so formulated another umbrella group, a different Oitlander who greatly outnumbered and outproduced the Afrikaner, but would not be given the vote, this time because of their skin tone. Needless to say to many of you, these non-whites of what became South Africa didn't get the vote for almost 100 years. Yeah, we are talking until the year 1994. Swaziland's blacks watched helplessly as the British apportioned two-thirds of post-war Swaziland to private concessions. The remaining third of what was once Swaziland survived as a poor protectorate until 1968, when Swaziland emerged an independent country. What about the Sutu or the Zulu? We may get to that in another episode. New Zealand, Australia, and Canada's volunteers served admirably for the British during this war. Their service in this war fueled greater desire for independence from the British Empire. Throughout the war, Alfred Milner worked hard to make sure the gold mines kept their production up and stayed hell-bent on this after the war. The mines, in a way, were key to funding South Africa's development. Milner made more moral and even political errors. He recruited Chinese migrants to work in the mines for low wages and allowed these Chinese to be flogged when they didn't perform satisfactorily. Allowing Chinese in to take those mining jobs that mining owners wanted to be as low wage as possible did not do anything to endear Milner to many South Africans. Allowing those Chinese to be flogged caused enough consternation in Britain to help propel Campbell, Bannerman, and the Liberals into power in the House of Commons in 1906. This new British government expedited the process of South African self-rule. That isn't to say that Milner's hopes and Milner's kindergarten's work to anglicize, to make these new colonies in their British stepmother's image, had much hope of success by 1906. Not nearly enough British immigrated to these new colonies. Milner's hope of importing British women to repopulate these colonies with more British children didn't work either. I'll post a link to an article I wrote about this British Women's Emigration Association in the show notes. When the Union of South Africa emerged as a dominion, Louis Boitza served as the first prime minister. His friend, Jan Smuts, took his place until their political party lost power in 1924. But that wouldn't be the last time that Jan Smuts served as prime minister. I could go into much more depth and breadth about the path South Africa took after the Anglo-Boer War, but that would require at least another episode. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is our final chapter in this first and maybe only season of Forgotten Wars. If you'd like more depth and breadth about what course, what we now know as South Africa, took after the war, I'd ask something I've asked many a time before. Share the show. Show me that you've shared the show using the contact link in the show notes. Writing and researching this season has been a long, grueling process. I thank all of you who've taken time to listen to the fruit of over 15 months 
and nearly 2,500 hours of hard work. I hope this won't be the last time you hear from me on the show. Your purchasing from our sponsors, purchasing from our modest online store, supporting us on Patreon, your suggesting me for interviews or speaking engagements, or donating to the show will help determine whether there will be a second season. But while I wait and see if this show's efforts are worthy, I'll focus on my family and my students. In a few weeks, I will be all clear after my recent back surgery to start holding my son again. And of course, tossing him up high into the air again. I will be all clear to love my wife by stumbling around trying to do manly stuff around the house. For this next school year, I will be focused on earning national board certification as a high school history teacher. This process helps me grow as a teacher in the fall 2019 spring 2020 school year until COVID cut the year too short for me to get the samples and videos from the classroom that I needed to submit for consideration. COVID cutting that year short and really altering this recent fall 2020 spring 2021 school year for the worse is what pushed me to make lemons out of lemonade and give this podcast, a podcast I'd been considering for a couple years, a shot, beginning in spring 2020 when I began my research. And now, after presenting you with this first season of the show, everything comes full circle. I'll make a second attempt at achieving national board certification and getting dramatically better for my students. Wish me luck, or pray me some favor and patience as I focus on all that stuff this next school year. By May of 2022, I'll hopefully have submitted everything and taken the test. And maybe I'll know then that pursuing a second season of this podcast is worth it. But regardless of the results, you all love your neighbor and may you be blessed. I have yet another limited time announcement for you on this July 23rd, 2021. If you'd like to hear more eyewitness accounts of what was happening during the anglo Boer War, I have great news for you. Rather than letting the 20 or so books that I used to help me write this season of Forgotten Wars just sit in storage or on a shelf forever, I'm going to be mailing those books to loyal listeners like you. I read Witnesses to War, at least the parts that were in English. If you're hearing this announcement then you have the opportunity to win Witnesses to War, a book filled with eyewitness accounts of what was going on during the anglo Boer War. You can win this book by doing something free and simple. First, share episode 1.3 of the show via email or on social media. If you'd like an example of text you could use to share episode 1.3, check out this episode's show notes. It would go something like, Want to learn about the Boer Wars and other clashes that ravaged South Africa after European settlement? Then start with episode 1.3 of the Forgotten Wars podcast, available on Apple, Spotify, and most other places you find podcasts. Next, when people reply to your email or react to your share on social media, take a screenshot. Finally, send me a screenshot of your share with the accompanying responses you got from people. The first person to send me a screenshot that meets this criteria will get the Witnesses to War book mailed at my expense to them with a note of gratitude. Again, I will mail the book for free to the winner. Once I've got a winner, I will erase this announcement promptly. All right, share episode 1.3. It's a win-win. 